Okay, hello, I'm Michael. Thanks for this uh, awesome introduction. Impro potentially improving the quality of science as a whole. I mean, yeah, of course. What else, right? Okay. They say, they say. Okay, um, today I will take you on a small journey. Uh, discussing the topic of natural computing. Yeah? So for a start, let me have a small a survey. Who among you has some sort of natural science training? Math, biology? Yes, one, two, three. OK, so the m minority. This is great, because for the other portion of the audience, I have designed this talk. Yeah, so it will, uh, it will be pretty, I hope it will be pretty high level. You can always interrupt me and ask questions, right? And. What's important for me is please take away the concepts. Don't get hung up on details, right? OK. So the talk will have three parts. First part is natural computing in a nutshell. Second part will be a case study on a computational problem, namely the shortest path problem. And the third part will be some sort of mm, discussing the evaluation of these approaches. Yeah? And let us start right away. So first I want to, di to discuss what natural computing is in general. So this is a very diverse field that is, lives from at the intersection of several uh, classical science uh, disciplines like biology, physics, chemistry, computer science. All those things come together to form natural computing. And what are the questions that this uh, field tries to address. So first of all, this field tries to design new algorithms by looking at nature. Yeah? So look at some process in nature, study it, find out what makes it tick, what makes it work, and then apply this uh, knowledge to do some sort of computation. Yeah? Computations can be very of very various uh, sorts. An example for this um, nature-inspired algorithms we have heard already today, Hans Günther talked about neural networks, right? So where you try to mimic the, f the way a brain works to do computation, right? If any of you has checked your emails in the last five minutes or so and you have found spam, then these algorithms didn't work well because Neural networks are part of spam filterings and similar things. So they work for us. Mostly you don't know, but those things are really put in practice. Yeah? A different example is, I don't know, ant colony optimization. This comes um, from this. I will discuss it later. This is this picture here. So various um, um, applications for this. Also, uh, evolutionary algorithms is a hot topic in this uh, line of research. Okay, the next thing is, um, trying to reproduce uh, some, something you observe in nature using computers. Yeah? So this is the synthesis of natural phenomena. On the right, this is a, a very nice picture of some sort of weeds, you would think, but in truth they have been produced by some sort of algorithm, some sort of model is able to uh, build these structures. And if you look at them, I mean, yeah, they are pretty convincing. I mean, maybe, maybe this is not so convincing. I don't know, but these, I mean, I would not be surprised to see it in the field somewhere, right? And there are various, um, various examples of this um, line of research where the goal is to create artificial life, artificial, I don't know, immune systems. That's um, a broad, broad field of research, yeah? And the last thing is also very interesting, um, use natural materials uh, to do computation. What does this mean? Um, what does this picture say? So this is typical, typical image of a piece of DNA, maybe, or some combination of the things. And one way to do computing with natural materials is using DNA. So DNA is very well defined. It has certain elements. These elements, you can do certain, comp uh, certain operations on them. You can add them. You can copy strands of DNA. There's a certain set of things that you can do. And you can use this set of operations that are available to actually compute things. Yeah? And you can write down um, very general models of computation using these uh, building blocks that you can get from DNA. Um, another very nice example is quantum computing. It's also a very hot topic, you probably have heard about it, where you use the states of, I don't know, some electron in some orbital that has some special superposition state that encodes a qubit. You can use these physical states to do computation. Yeah? This is also 
very potentially very impactful. People are trying to build these computers and small, very small computers have been built, but once they grow and once they are really able to uh, execute um, quantum algorithms, then the impacts will be enormous because cryptography and other things that are like everywhere nowadays, yeah, that they will break down. As soon as a quantum computer works, then your online banking is gone. Your secure online shopping in Amazon is gone. All of these things, they will be, they will be trivially, trivially be destroyed. Yeah? There will be new forms of encryption, quantum encryption probably, but you see the impacts are enormous. I mean, I don't know, I, I, I didn't enter a bank for like years. So potentially life-changing things are among these. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Why are we interested in these things? Well, like I already said, it's potentially life-changing. You never know with this basic science things. And the general goal is what? We are studying nature. We are thinking that it somehow is efficient because it works well. It has been honed by evolution for millions of years, whatever. So the assumption is it works well. We want to harness this efficiency that is somehow inbuilt. It can also mean many things. Example, physics and phys physical systems, they tend to evolve towards states of lower energy. And this is most, most always it means higher stability. Yeah? If you have a free proton flying around, it meets a free electron flying around. They combine into a stable formation, which we know as the hydrogen atom. Right? So those things are very common. From biology, I mean, there's evolution. Everyone knows about this, right? So the, the weak die and the strong, the fit survive. So evolution drives biological organisms towards evolving higher fitness so that they can survive, right? But there's a huge but attached, and this is, I mean, I don't know, a bit provocative maybe, because people like to get hung up on this uh, chasing the optimal solutions for systems. It is not, in my opinion, it is not always, it's not true that natural systems always reach optimum, optimum states. Yeah? There's no reason to believe that an evolution, that evolution is achieving an optimum state. It is not even clear if it drives towards an, a global optimum state. Yeah? So even if it is, how do you know if the, op if the optimum is here? How do you know whether you are here or here or here? Because it's a very slow process, right? So you, you have to put some thought into these processes and not be like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be optimizing something. Let's just do it, right? So you don't have to think it through. And another example from physics, for example, I mean, if you look at the glass, the glass is an amorphous material. It's basically trying to become a crystal, but it can't because it's trapped in a local optimum. Yeah, yeah really, it can. I mean, there's this local optimum and the material is trapped. If you would heat it up and cool it faster or slower or whatever, you can maybe trick it into becoming something different. But the normal glass that we are used to just is trapped. It's a very sort, a very sad material somehow. Anyways, so this is, this is something that I like to think about. So that concludes the first part, like a very broad introduction to the ideas that are important in this field. In the second part, we come to the uh, more computing-oriented things. Um, namely, we will discuss the shortest path problem. It's a problem everybody knows, maybe not in this general formulation, but everyone knows it. Okay, why? Look at this. Classical computing, find the shortest path between two points. Yeah? Cities in a street network. You want to go from Frankfurt to, say, Berlin. How do you drive your car? Which streets do you know? And in this context, I want you, so this is the only slide where I want you to remember some terminology. I want you to think of the streets as, as, as nodes in a graph. And the graph is actually the, the, um, the graph is the cities and the streets, and the streets are the edges and the cities are the nodes. Yeah? So other terms are network, street network, those are all kind of used in the same fashion, but I will use this term graph to denote the whole thing, the nodes and the edges, and I will speak about edges, those are the streets, and I will speak about cities, those are the nodes, and uh, nodes and those are the cities. Okay. Also important is this problem is easy. An indication that this problem is easy is you can go to Google, you can type any two, any two 
places and it will answer you in, I don't know, five milliseconds or so. And in this small period of time, it will look through billions of streets. So only, this is very easy. Yeah. There are other problems that are super hard, also for Google. This is not one of them. Okay. Okay, so and now we will take this problem and discuss it in the context of natural computing. First of all, there is a way to trick ants into doing this or to study ant colonies and apply, apply this sort of thinking to the uh, biological material or agents in this case. So what ants are doing is soon there's some nests somehow and there's some food source. Yeah? And now there's this lonely ant and it's kind of exploring as it sees fit, and it finds the, suit, the food source, and it's returning to the um, nest. And what it does is, what the whole algorithm kind of tries to encompass is, are these, sim these uh, simple three steps. First, first is, when an ant runs a path, it deposits some sort of pheromone, some, some things that ants can smell, and they like it. That is, if it's on the path, they would take this path with higher probability. And the third thing is, this is important, this pheromone evaporates after some time. This is important for several reasons. I mean, if you go back to think about glass, if you don't have this, then they can get trapped in local, local solutions, and you want to have the global optimum solution, right? So what several ants will be doing is, they will travel, select some way, and then the shortest way will be traveled more often because the ants are faster on this way, right? So they will deposit more pheromone that will lead to more ants uh, taking this path. And after some time, most of them will walk the shortest path, and only a couple of stray guys will still try to find something better. Yeah? This is still important that this exists because there could be a shorter way somewhere else and this could be a local minimum. In this case it's not, but it could be. Yeah. So this is important. And this, these simple ideas, they can be formalized into a very powerful algorithm. And this algorithm can compute basically everything. Yeah. From train tables to, I don't know, resource scheduling to image processing. The applications are very numerous. Okay, and now we take this same problem and study it in the context of what Fizarum is doing, right? And the guy that we see all around here. And for this I first show you a video. Or I will try to show you a video. Uh -huh. Here's where we are at. Mm -hmm. I hope you're still with me. I apologize. I hope you're still with me. I apologize. Uh, the experts amongst you already know this video. I have seen it like a trillion times. Anyways, I will guide you through. This is the famous uh, Nakagaki lab experiment where you have this maze. Put Fizarum in the maze. The brown areas are forbidden. They are too dry. Fizarum doesn't like it. And then after some time, the whole maze is covered. Yeah. The whole maze is covered. And now we turn this into the shortest path problems. We define two cities. A and B, the yellow stuff are the streets, and I'll find the streets that are the, that form the shortest connection, right? And this is actually, this is actually uh, Toshi, and he has much different hair color on this video now, I realized, and I think that was 10 years ago, the video. I met him in December, he's a very nice guy. Okay, so back to the video. What's happening here is Fizaum is kind of exploring a bit and finds this food. This is food, the white thing, oat flakes. And now as time goes by, some sort of processing is going on in this organism. And what we will see now is that slowly, uh, you've seen everything was covered in the beginning, everything was uniformly yellow. And now, is the, is the video freezing or am I just spacing out? Oh, no. Okay, it's still running. Good. So now we see that it slowly retracts from paths, from certain paths. Namely, exactly those paths that are not on the shortest path. So everything that is suboptimal is kind of being rejected by the organism. And this is the result. Mind you, all of this is happening without any central control. There is no brain, there is no nervous system, there's nothing that looks from, at this from the top and says this is what has to happen, right? This is um, very remarkable. 
Okay, so much for the video. I will not go program now. <laughs> I could though, but this will bore you to no end. I will try to restore, restore my talk here. Yeah? I mean, it's beautiful code, right? I spot a bug. You spot a bug, great. I will talk to you after the talk. Um, because it's very buggy still. Anyways, now we go back to the talk. What we have seen here is again the shortest path problem now in a different context with a different organism. We have seen two food sources, we have seen a path here and some other paths here, and we have seen that the longer path kind of shrinks, and I try to indicate this by these blue arrows, and the, uh, the um, shortest path gets reinforced. So again, this is this positive reinforcement mechanism. Yeah? Like ants are using this path, so we put more pheromone on it, so more ants use it. And here's also the same. So there's a lot of flow on the pipe, so we make the pipe bigger, that causes to be even that causes even more flow to go through the pipe, right? So this is basically the same idea. It's not perfect, but it is something. Um, what is interesting, you can formalize all of these ideas into a precise algorithm, and when you write it down, when you write down a model, you can use this model to do all sorts of computation. Yeah? You can also prove, it's important, you can prove that this finds the solution, always. For any graph, for any street network, for any two cities. Yeah? This is a very powerful concept, to put it down into a model and then prove absolute statements yeah? using math. Okay, and now, we go back to reality. Uh, we have seen this, this model, uh, we have seen the video, something happens, it seems to be kind of similar. But the thing is with these models, you, you never know how much, how good it is, yeah? how, how faithful it represents um, the reality. So you, you can obtain proofs and stuff, but these proofs, they only talk about the model. They don't talk about what happens in the lab. So at some point, you need to go back to the lab and check whether what you write down is actually valid. Yeah? And this is what I wanted to indicate here by this experimentation. You need to test observations, you need to test the predictions uh, that you can get out of your model. Yeah? And that, to do this, you need a large body of data. It's not enough to repeat an experiment exactly once. Also, this maze experiment has been repeated hundreds of times and always, or like not always, but in most of the cases, significantly, in most of the cases, it produced the shortest path. The same is true for any model. Yeah? You need to go back to the source and test it, and you need data to do that. And now we come to the last part, evaluation. I already tried to introduce this. So now I assume you are so inspired that you will now go home and take a piece of paper and a pen and write down a new model that explains whatever you saw in the video, right? It's great. But then you kind of need to, it's only half the work, because you also need to kind of find out if this is any good, the model that you write down. And now this is what we're going to discuss now. Okay, you have your model, you come back to me, I'll show you this picture. Now the question is, is does your model has anything in common with what we actually see in the lab? It's a good question, right? You know, what, what do you do to find out? I mean, assume your model predicts that the thickness of these veins is a certain number on average. What you could do now is you could go to this picture and take your little ruler, put it there, and measure it like everywhere. Yeah? But needless to say, since there's like a thousand veins, it would take you a long time to verify the prediction for even one image, right? So you will soon wish, couldn't be a computer doing this for me, yeah? or some other sort of uh, computing slave, maybe a grad student, right? Anyways, couldn't be a grad student doing this, uh, but there's actually now computer methods to do this. Yeah? I mean, Hans Günther already presented something similar with the speculation thing. What you need is actually this. Yeah, you need a graph. You need nodes. Well, those are the colored nodes here. And you need the streets. You need the cities and you need the streets. Once you have this formation, once you have this abstract object, you can do all sorts of things with it. You can easily have the computer go through all these gray streets and measure how thick it is. And go back to your model and verify. Yeah? So this is very powerful once you have this graph. So this is the process, yeah? So you do the experiments, you turn them into graphs, 
you compute some sort of meaningful stuff on the graph and compare it with and compare it with the prediction that your model makes, right? And then you go back to your model and change it, or maybe not change it, and then you repeat. You don't do this for a single image, you do it for a large amount of images to get solid statements out of it, yeah? To have some idea what is the statistical error and what is the systematic error that I'm making. This is a very difficult process. This step is difficult. Controlling experimental settings is difficult. You have to repeat it. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources. Most of it's difficult. This step is difficult once because you need to write the software that looks at the image and gives you a graph. Once you have done it, then it's done, right? You don't have to write it again. So this is difficult once. This you can easily do. This is always easy because there's libraries and computer methods that have dealt with these problems for a long time now. And this is just the creative part. Also, this is creative. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give you an idea how difficult these steps are. And what is the next slide? Ah, yeah. I wanted to say that you do this only for one image, now you need to do this for several images. I mean a whole series, but this is now easy. Why? Because we have the software. And I'll show you how this looks like for a video of, uh, of graphs. Or I go back to programming again. Yeah, which I do. Okay. So again, this is the graph. And at some point it should start moving. And what you see here is, this is a series of like 50 images or so, and the images, photographs taken every two minutes, okay? So it's like the 50 times two minutes is the length of the series. And for every, every image in the series, every frame gets fed, gets fed in our software, returns the graph, and then I just plot it onto the input. So you see how this moves, yeah. And you can, if you look closely, you can see for some veins that they are, that they are um, fluctuating in thickness, which is good because this is something that is actually observed in the lab. Yeah. You, can really, you can really see stuff um, moving, around, moving around, yeah. And once you have these graphs, yeah, the sky is the limit. You can do all sorts of computation on this. Okay. Now I go back to the talk, the last time, I hope. How am I doing in terms of time? Ah, great. That makes fun. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, maybe it's five. Okay, I get your drift. I'm going to finish now. Ouch. Okay, I showed you the movie, right? <laughs> okay, and now I was also asked by Teresa, where she is, um, she's there, um, to talk about this graph repository. I told you that it's difficult and time and resource intensive to do the experiments. Once you have this experimental data, you switch on the software and it outputs graphs. This is easy then. But you kind of need to be in a position to do these experiments, which requires lab resources, which requires knowledge. You need to know how to cultivate these things. And it's not clear that everyone has access to those. So probably it's definitely not true that everyone has access to those. Okay. So what the idea of this um, repository is, we, we just take all the graphs that we produce, we slap them onto, into a bag and put this bag online. And everyone who is interested in looking at these pictures for whatever reasons and the graphs can use them. So when you are at home, after you write down your model, you just go online and you download a couple of these graphs and write a bit of code that compares the graphs with what your model says and then you are doing already great. Yeah? I mean, it is maybe a bit more difficult than I than the image I'm painting, but in principle, this is what you could do. And this is true for many, for many things. I mean, maybe you have seen this postcard that is an, in the entrance here with this uh, Petri dish, and there's this net, this fine-grained net of something with the center and a Petri dish. This is the product of an algorithm, right? Now, it produces some sort of circles. You could measure the area of these circles, the, the, the length, whatever in the real data and compare this to whatever this algorithm says, right? If the algorithm produces something that looks completely different to what we see in the lab, 
Well, then the algorithm is probably crap. But you need to do the testing. Yeah, it's not enough to just have a nice algorithm that does something. At least for me, it's not enough. For the computational part, it's enough. I mean, it's, if, you, if you prove that the algorithm solves the shortest path problem, you are done as a computer scientist. Yeah? But as a physicist or a biologist, you probably want more. And so, this is one of the things that I, I'm dreaming of with this repository. Okay. So we want everyone to be able to work with these graphs, right? That means everyone can do the measurements on the data that they want. And they can do their own comparison. Yeah? And also, it's also important, it's nice when other people are also creating experimental data. They have the lab space, they have the resources. Why not contribute? Yeah? Why not also put this in the back for others to access? And the last point, which probably is the most important point in this audience here, you never know what kind of unforeseen use comes out of your data, right? I mean, I was very, I was kind of shocked the first time I heard about this Fisarum sonification because this idea is so far away from my uh, everyday life as an apprentice scientist, I can't even describe to you. But it's a good idea nevertheless, right? Once you wrap your mind around it, it's great. Yeah? I mean, why not use these graphs for sonification? Have a walker that walks through the graph and every time it hits a thin edge, it says A and, or says a song or whatever. There's ideas. Come to me afterwards if you, if you want to know more about my crazy ideas. Anyways, this is an important point, yeah? Especially in this kind of audience. Um, invite people to contribute, Hans Günther, right? You have graphs. I know it. <laughs> I know it. Anyways. And that brings me to my summary. So what do I want to, you to take away? So have some idea what this natural computing is trying to do. Yeah? Studying nature, trying to extract the efficiency and do some, some computation. Computation can mean many things. Can mean shortest path problem. Can mean figure out how trains are supposed to arrive and leave stations. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Also take away that writing down models is only half the work. Or should be only half the work in my opinion. Yeah? There comes the evaluation part afterwards which is also important. Especially for the people that are more like physicists and biologists. They, they care more about the thing than about the code. Which is fine, right? Experimental data equals graphs is, yeah, makes everything easier. Looking at the picture, you, you saw the picture, right? I mean, yeah, you need some sort of data structure that does the work for you, and this data structure is a graph. Um, yeah, the last part I also discussed it at length. Making this public can only increase the use we can get out of it. And with this, uh, I, I end my talk. This nice picture is from our friendly labs. I thought it was very fitting because I think if I look at this, I see like some sort of tundra where at some nice rainy day stuff comes out all of a sudden and then it's going to die again the next day. It's beautiful. I mean, yeah. Okay. Thank you.